Welcome to the Tudor Dixon Podcast. I'm Tudor Dixon, and it's great to have you tuning in today. This is kind of a special day for me because we have someone that when I was a kid was a total teenage heartthrob, and I'm not trying to embarrass him or anything, but every girl that I knew had a poster in the room with Kirk Cameron's face on it. So I'm really <laughs> excited to talk to him. Um, we were all huge Growing Pains fans, and, and I'm really kind of sad that there is not a show like that for my kids to watch and get involved in. And I just think it's really cool what you've done and how your story has inspired so many people because you, you left Hollywood behind, found faith, you're raising six kids. Kirk Cameron, thank you so much for being on today. We really appreciate it. Tudor, it's a pleasure and, and an honor to be here. Thanks for having me on the program. And um, yeah, I, I, I gave up Hollywood and, and, and left it behind for left behind and moved on to some other things that uh, are a little more meaningful to me than, uh, you know, I am Mike holding up the sneaking video out the window. Because... <laughs> there it is. There it is. <laughs> Yes, there it we is. have it. And, 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 I, and I don't think it needs to win any, uh, it's not going to win any awards. It wasn't the greatest movie in the world, but it certainly marked a time in my life where the focus of my mind and my heart, um, we're, we're heading toward things of, of meaning and uh, permanence. So uh, that was reflected in the career and the projects that I chose. And uh, I'm really, really grateful for how things have turned out. It's really interesting to me as I, kind of look at your life story. And I think a lot of us have had this coming to faith as I, I think you almost, some people obviously have had that their whole childhood, but there's a moment when you realize you've been saved and there's a moment when you want to share the good news in a different way. And it's been, this past week has been interesting for me because I've watched my daughter graduate her eighth grade class from a Christian school and that mm. faith base. But she's doing this at a time where, there is a lot of focus on pride. And I mean, this is Pride Month, right? So that message of pride is really pushed on kids that pride is important. And I think that we as parents, as Christian parents, kind of go, okay, there's there, that's a hard concept to discuss because I'll say to my girls, I'm so proud of you for doing this. And they're like, but mom, isn't that a bad thing? And I explain to them, you know, being excited for your success and cheering you on is different from what it means to not be a prideful person. So how to tell us a little bit about how this book explains the dangers of becoming prideful. Well, first of all, good, good for you. What, what there's, there, there is like honor roll mom, uh, teaching moment for the rest of us, uh, to talk to kids about what pride really means. So when we say, I'm proud of you, sweetheart, well, you just expressed it. You said, I'm expressing how, how, how excited I am for you. I'm cheering you on. I'm grateful that you've learned this lesson and accomplished this thing that you did. And that reminds me actually of what we read in the Bible. We see at Jesus' baptism, um, the voice from God the Father saying, this is my son whom I love and in him I am well pleased. Listen to him. I, th th there's a father who's, who's the, the, the buttons of pride are popping off, uh, you know, his, 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 his chest, but that's the kind of gratitude and cheering on that we want to um, pour into. But pride properly understood is a self-centered thing. It's where I judge other people because I think I'm better than them. Uh, pride is the root of racism. Pride is the root of misogyny, mm. of all violations of human rights. Uh, Jesus said pride is what caused him to see uh, Satan fall from heaven like lightning because full of pride, Satan wants to steal the glory of God. And that's what pride does. Pride makes us think that we're God, that we don't need God. We can create reality. We can create and define morality, reality, gender, and anything else that we want. So good, good for you. I'm, I'm trying to teach kids the lesson uh, through this book that I wrote called Pride Comes Before the Fall. And it's the story of a tiger named Valor who uh, uh, has to partner up with a, a, a rookie elephant named Kevin in a boat race. And he learns the important lesson that arrogance and anger uh, all stem from pride and that the path forward to win in life is to consider others above yourselves and learn to be humble. That is awesome. You've had huge success having these book readings. And I think that's something that people, 
I guess I would say at this moment where we see a lot of prideful people and we see this happening in business and we see this happening in politics, especially, mm. I mean, I come, I'm coming out of a, a, the political world. And so we're seeing this kind of pushed on, on people. And so this idea of having a values-based book reading has not been the focus. And you came out and initially it was not well received by public libraries, but your last book reading was pretty impressive, wasn't it? Well, well and the funny thing is that coming from the Hollywood world, which is the land of make-believe, uh, we make a living at creating perceptions that are not reality, right? It's, 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 all, it's right. all shiny this way, but really it's not. Um, what I've learned is that there are libraries, thousands of them all over the country who would love to have parents come and read books about love, joy, peace, humility, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Why? Because that's what we want in our kids. We want them to be like, do you want your kids to be full of pride? Do you want your kids? Hey, honey, I want you to go to school today and I want you to learn how to be a proud person. How to be full of pride. Well, that's when you get them self. saying back to you, I don't need to go to school. <laughs> yeah. No, we want them to, to, to be humble. So when we were denied by over 50 woke libraries that previously held drag queen mm -hmm. story hours, we pushed back, wrote a letter and reminded them that this is the United States of America and you can't deny people coming to uh, a story hour or a reading room simply because you don't like their viewpoint. And that's a violation of free speech. That's violation of uh, the freedom of uh, religion and all, all, all kinds of things. And so we told them that we would be uh, prepared to assert our constitutional rights in court if they kept it up. They caved. We went to the Indianapolis Library and over 2,500 parents and kids overwhelmed six floors of the library. They oh, were out the door, so down amazing. the street. But then there's other libraries like uh, Seattle Public Library, which uh, uh, welcomed us. Although there's protesters coming in holding boards about something about hate and something about me growing into a real pain. So <laughs> you got you to gotta applaud him for his effort and his... Yeah, right. Th creative. That's right. He's creative. And then we were in Loudoun County Public Library yesterday uh, across the hall from uh, a leftist leaning group called Teach Truth. And in fact, that's ironic because th they're teaching lies in the name of truth. And that's why we have to be educated and why mm. we need to teach these things to our kids because they see something that has right. the skin of a, of the truth, but it's stuffed with the lie. So we come into something called pride month and kids think it's about being proud of yourself. But li listen, e even rightly understood, if you were to say, well, I'm proud of you or I'm faithful or I'm grateful for who God's made me. Uh, pride month isn't about that. Weirdly, it's about wanting the rest of the world to celebrate other people's sex life. I mean, think about that. Right. I mean, really get down to it. I mean, I can love my enemies. I can love being a man. I can love being an, a, a, an American. Uh, and you can too. And we can be into different things politically and hobbies and sports and look different. But if you're part of the pride thing, it's really about who you like to have sex with or who you like to have sex as. And we want to be pushing that into our children. That's right. No, wildly that's something that we've, and abusive. We've talked about so many times is that this is solely about who you are having sex with. And, and that is such a, you have to question why do people want to bring this into the lives of children? And then the flip side of that is that you're coming and you're reading books to kids that are giving them hope, that are bringing joy, that are are showing them future and how to, to love one another. And that is not, and in, no, and in no way are you putting down other groups. I think that's the thing that is so important and so key. When you see these manipulative people come in with signs that say this is hate, no, no, there is nothing hateful about this. You are not you are not putting anyone down. You are not prideful. You're not coming out and saying we're better. You're saying there is an opportunity to live in a joyful and hopeful way. And I think that's something that's so key right now in crisis, because we have so many kids in crisis, families in crisis. It's just a tough time. And, and honestly, I was telling you about my daughter graduating and my, a friend of ours who is not in a Christian school said it was shocking to me to see the kids had just lost a classmate un unexpectedly. And she said, 
the ease with which they were able to talk about the joy of her life in this time was amazing to me because they had faith. And like there is a there is a reason that we are asked to spread the good word. 100 <laughs> percent. Yeah, 100 um, percent. I, I love this quote from uh, Noah Webster. Uh, but, but before before I, I get to that, um, I, I want people to know that uh, what I'm doing is part of a much larger movement of, uh, of a revival and a renaissance of the values that led to this being the freest, strongest, most blessed nation in the history of the world. And if you want to uh, check out not only my book, but books that were written by many different authors, go to bravebooks.com. And they've got books that have pro-God, pro-America values all day, every day that teach the fruit of the spirit and warn against things like well, one book is called The Island of Free Ice Cream, warning children about the dangers of socialism. That's I we we actually have had the founder of Brave Books on cool. and so, I'm so glad that you brought that up because it is such an awesome thing to do for your kids yeah. that you have these books constantly coming to the house and just such an op awesome opportunity. So instead of watching the news and putting your face in your hands while you sit on the couch and cry in your Chick-fil-A soup, wondering what can we do, go to bravebooks.com and subscribe to the Book of the Month Club and a new book will show up at your kids or your grandkids' door every single month with a pro-God, pro-America value. And there, you're doing something. You're investing in their hearts and minds and planting seeds of fearless faith and moral integrity into the next generation. Okay, now um, Noah Webster, one of our founding fathers, had a great quote. And this is, this is so important for us to understand. I'm not trying to push religion on anybody. I'm not trying to force some people to believe something that they don't want to believe. In fact, that goes against my religion. But Noah Webster said it so well. Um, he was not only founding father, but father of American education. He gave us Webster's dictionary. And Noah Webster said, every government is built on some philosophy or religion. And the education of a nation will propagate that religion. In the United States of America, that foundational religion was Christianity. And it was sown into the hearts and minds of children for generations through the home, through private and public education. And it was root that produced the fruit of success and liberty and freedom in America. And if we want to continue with our success and our uh our, our freedom, it depends on instilling into the children of America the principles of Christianity. That's not somebody's opinion. That's the fact from the people who understood the blueprint of the nation that has been unique in its successes throughout all of history. It's the ability to self-govern because you love God and you love other people. It's interesting. I'll let you in on um, a little bit of background when you're running for office, because yeah. <laughs> obviously I was running for office in a blue. Well, it was a purple state at the time. Now it's a blue state, but we're, you know, we're still calling it purple because I believe we can get it back. But um, even in the conservative circles, one of my very first meetings, I was talking to the woman and she was asking me why I was running and I, you know, I went through and all I said about my faith was as a family, we prayed about the decision before we came to it. And then we talked and talked. And at the end of it, she looked at me and she said, um, let me give you one bit of advice. Don't ever tell anybody about your faith because you will turn so many people off. It is something that people make the mistake of all the time and you should never do it. And then just a few weeks ago, I spoke with one of my supporters and he, he said the same thing. You need to make sure that the people around you never speak of Christianity. And it struck me last. And you know that it it's one of those things that when you're out there, you live in a world where you're told not to offend people. And I've thought about Which that so much in the past few weeks. Right. Right. I, but think about that. They are allowed to say to me something that you, I mean, it, it is some, it's the first thing, you know, that's the first part of me. It is what guides me. It is what Amen. helps me to make my decisions. It is what, it is what guides me in my parenting choices. 
And that is something that in the country that was founded on Christianity, we are now told that if you are running for office, you should never bring that up. And like I said, it, I'm not trying to, same as you, I'm not telling you, you should be a Christian. I'm not, I am telling you, this is what guides me. That is my North Star. You should know what is telling me what direction I should go. And you should know that about me, but we are told to hide that. Isn't that shocking? Yeah. I actually am telling people they should become Christians because I love them and I want them to become <laughs> Christians and know the, the loving creator who has a plan for their life that will lead to their peace, their blessing, uh, and a relationship with God and with others. And, and I know that you want the best for people too. Uh, it's interesting. Um, there's so much that we could talk about here. I, I mean, just, just the very idea that someone tells you that you should never talk about your faith because it would be offensive. Uh, that statement in right. itself is offensive to millions of people like you and like me in the United States. And I, I, would, I, I so want to respond to people like that by saying your hatred and your bigotry are showing. Um, you might want to cover those up because you're going to lose all of your friends when they recognize that you have a religion of your own that you're trying to shove down our throat. And it's called secular humanism, which has no room for Christians like me. That's the height of um, arrogance and pride. And it's the opposite of inclusivity and diversity. You want to rid your land of people like me. And it's actually... The people from my, my clan um, who actually love God and the principles of Christianity that make room for atheists, Buddhists, Hindus, Muslims, and everyone else to be part of selecting leadership in the country through the voting process. Uh, that's only the result of the principles that I adhere to, and those are the principles of Christianity. So let me ask you this, because um, part of our Christian faith is to be loving, to to take care of widows and children. And that's something that I think that people have sort of twisted around on Christianity and said, well, you, you know, you're, you're stopping that from happening. That we're the loving ones. You have six children yourself. Four of those kids are adopted. That is so beautiful. Explain to us, like, what led you to that choice to adopt and how have you seen your faith grow it, those children in, in all different ways? Because I know as a mom of four, every one of them has a different personality and they are all very unique and exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we love having six kids and, um, you know, um, having six kids was the result of uh, really loving my wife a lot. And we have uh, four children that we adopted first and then we had two kids the natural way. And my, my wife is actually an adopted child. And so that's a very special bond that she has with, with our adopted children. And uh, in fact, I just I made a movie this came out this last summer called Life Mark with the Kendrick brothers. It's all about the beauty of adoption and the value of life in the womb. I can't imagine where my, my life would be right now without the most important people that are in it, my wife and my children. And if, if, uh, if it weren't for valuing life in the womb and recognizing adoption as a beautiful uh, method of bringing families together. Uh, I wouldn't have my wife. I wouldn't have my four kids. And if my wife hadn't been born, if she'd been lost through an abortion, say, then my two natural born children wouldn't be here either. So mm -hmm. adoption is very important to me and to my wife, to our family and to millions of Americans. And that's why it's always going to be at the heart of the things that I do. So why do you think that's not a bigger part of a bigger push in this country? Because we obviously went through just now a major in 2022, a major fight over choice, but there doesn't seem to be that same passion over fighting to make it easier to adopt. It's hard to adopt in many states. It's expensive to adopt and it's hard to do that. How do we change that? I mean, what, what can be done to show people the beauty of adoption? Well, I, I don't think it's, I don't think that's that hard. We've just got to have the same heart that God has for the widows and the orphans. As you said earlier, true religion is helping widows and orphans in their time of need. There are so many kids out there that need to be adopted. Unfortunately, uh, there's not as many uh, when you have so many abortions and those children being um, cut up and flushed down the sewers of the United States. But there are thousands and thousands and thousands lining up 
to adopt children. There are more parents out there who either can't have children or want to have children but are un, unable to uh, who want to adopt kids. And so we just need to do it. If we can just adopt those kids um, and adopt the, the, the orphans, we, we could make a huge difference. And just think, um, Jesus himself was adopted by Joseph when he found out his wife or mm-hmm. his, the woman he's betrothed to be married to is pregnant. Think of that. Think of, think of Moses himself, the great lawgiver of the Ten Commandments, was adopted when his mother had to put him in a basket, floated him down a river, and the Pharaoh's daughter comes and, and adopts him and sees him as her own. Adoption is a beautiful thing where God brings people from different backgrounds together and makes them into a family, just like he does with us. I was an atheist. Now I'm his son and a member of his family. He adopted me when I came to him by faith. You have such a beautiful way of intertwining every story into faith and connecting it back to the Bible. But you you just said you were an atheist and yeah. you were. that. Explain that story because I think that's also something intimidating when you talk about faith to someone who doesn't get it. I mean, I also know what it was as an adult to say, oh, actually, this is what it is to be saved and feel that change in your life. So I, I think, but I know because of that, I also know how it is easy to hold religious discussions at bay because you're not there yet. So explain what it was like to to have that transformation. Yeah, that's the that's that's the positive trans movement. Uh, we read yeah, about right. it. We read about it in the Bible, and uh, it's very exciting. It happened to me. I had that trans experience, and I went from a person that was reveling in the kingdom of darkness, and I was transformed by the renewing of my mind, not conformed to the pattern of this world, but transformed into the kingdom of God's love and light. That's really all it means. As an atheist, uh, I had faith that nobody uh, created everything out of nothing. That takes a lot of faith to be an atheist. Nobody times nothing equals everything. That nothing made everything. And then somebody took me to church and I heard the message of the gospel from the Bible. And I never understood that book. I just thought it was filled with these and vows and rules to ruin my life. And (laughs) then I understood that one day I will die and I will meet the creator of the sun and the moon and the stars, the one who forms babies in their mother's wombs, the one who causes roses and strawberries and uh, peaches and grapes to come up out of brown, colorless, I'm sorry, not colorless, but, but uh, you know, f- dirt that doesn't smell or it isn't sweet, and out comes cherries and watermelons and beautiful painted sunrises and s- sunsets in the sky with water and light, and I will give an account of my moral choices, and I will need his forgiveness, and he offers it to us at great cost to himself. And that was the death of his son, Jesus on the cross. That message captured me. I started asking questions and came to the conclusion that it required more faith for me to remain an atheist than it did for me to believe in God. And I went to church, read a Bible, and wanted to become a follower of Jesus Christ. And it was the best decision that I've ever made. Uh, And my pastor told me, Kirk, if anybody ever asked you, How did you find God in Hollywood? I want to remind you, you didn't find God. He wasn't lost. You were, and he found you. That's right. He'll leave the 99 to go after the one. Absolutely. It's it's fascinating to me. Something you said resonated, that you said all of those rules will ruin my life. That feeling of if I commit to God, then I have to step away from who I am and what I am. And I think that that goes all back to pride, right? Because I mean, we started this conversation with pride and I feel like we can end it on that same note because I think so many people are afraid to take that leap into even reading the word or go walking into a church today. We see that churches are struggling to get young people in, but I think that there is a time right now where that pride is leaving people so empty 
and all of the draw of social media and, and being self-important and self-care and ba life balance and all of those things that sound so good are leaving people really empty. And I go back to the story of the kids in my daughter's eighth grade class who just lost a classmate. And one of them, the mom said to me, and this really touches me. The mom said to me, my daughter overheard some of the adults say, I can't believe that she's gone. And she came up to me and she said, why did they say that? Because she's not gone. I know where she is. I'm like, that's faith. Mm. Yeah, that's so good. And, and children have an ability to see things that older people don't. Um, uh, we can be, we can be, blinded and our vision is is obscured by fear and by worry and by pride and and other types of things you know tutor i'm i'm sitting in a hotel room right now looking out my manhattan uh skyscraper window in my hotel and because of the fires in canada everything's very smoky here all right and and i cannot see anything beyond about half a mile and there's this cloud coverage this reminds me about something I know about faith. Hmm. I'm looking at the sky and I believe that the sun is on the other side of this smoke and those clouds, not because I can see the sun, but because the sun allows me to see everything else. Faith in God is similar. I don't believe in God because I can see God. I believe in him because his existence is what allows me to see everything else, to see love clearly, to see truth clearly, to see goodness clearly. Without God, we don't have the ability to perceive any of those things. And they say, well, atheists know love. Atheists can tell that there's light. Uh, goodness and, 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 and truth, right? That's because God exists. But if you take him out of the equation, everything goes dark. And as an atheist, I do, I make the mis I made the mistake many do today. And that is atheists steal from the Christian worldview. They steal from our worldview, the source of truth, beauty, and goodness and they hijack those and just assume that they're real. But according to their worldview, without God, none of that can really exist. Now, yeah, that's, I mean, it, it goes back to you say, saying that you didn't find God, he found you. And that, and that is, so I think that's important for, for people to hear is that even, I mean, especially, I think there's a lot of parents right now who feel like they've lost their kids in, in faith that, you know, we have a lot of kids that go off to college and they get kind of pulled into this, this concept of being prideful and, you know, what that looks like and, and stepping away from Christianity because, you know, there's now people that consider Christianity a hate group. I mean, this is really, it, we're really at this weird point of persecution that Americans never really had to face before because we were just very, relaxed in the fact that that was protected, right? We didn't have to cons be concerned about that, but now it's a choice and it's a deliberate choice to make. But even in those times when you are not trying to walk with God, he is there and he is showing you and he is always there to bring you back. And I think that is the coolest part about being a Christian and being a, a Christian parent, because there is there are all these outside these outside influences and there's never a moment where hope should be lost because he is always there and he is always seeking you. Oh, you are out there spreading this. Tell us a little bit more about the book and where people can find it and, and how they can see you reading to kids in libraries. So my very first book was called As You Grow, and it taught kids the value of biblical wisdom and growing the fruit of the spirit, like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Uh, my second book is called Pride Comes Before the Fall. And it's a great book about a tiger named Valor and an elephant named Kevin who have to learn a very important lesson about humility. And it's coming out at a perfect time, uh, June 1st. Kids are about to get out of school. We're just in time for summer reading programs. And during a month where kids are being taught that pride is a good thing and that they should have lots of it, we want to remind kids of the truth that pride is the base of all great mistakes. Mm -hmm. In fact, 
Pride is the opposite of love. We, we, we see the rainbow colored signs of pride and love, pride and love, but pride is about self and love is about others. So the truest expression of love is not pride, it's humility. And we just have uh, had a, a President Joe Biden this weekend raise the pride flag front and center on the White House. But did you know that George Washington raised the humility flag? He did that uh, under his authority as the commander in chief of the Continental Army in 1775, proving that the United States of America was built on humility, not on pride. So I made a phone call to the White House this morning, Tudor, and I suggested that if we really want to be known for love in America, we should replace the pride flag with the humility flag. That is awesome. I love that because here we have such a strong influence from Hollywood that we've been trying to really kind of battle. And you come from there, you have a voice, you are using it for so much good. It's really been an honor to have you on the program. And for anybody listening, check out Brave Books. They're in partnership with Kirk, what he's doing, the amazing things yeah. that you're doing going out there. And, and kids can be getting these books. Parents can be reading along. And I think the thing that I love most about this message that I, I feel like we need to get across is that this is just a lesson in how you can you can feel peace and you, I mean, I really do believe that your soul is at much more peace when you are living in a way accordance with what God is asking you to, how God is asking you to live. And it's not, it's not controversial. It is just filled with love and filled with hope. And, mm. and that's what you're out there well, teaching. Well, thank you for that. Um, I'll, I'll, you got to tell that to the protesters that are showing up <laughs> in our public libraries. Uh, so, so, something's controversial to them. And I, th I think that when we go against the spirit of the age and we, we properly define love and properly define humility, uh, there's going to be some pushback because there's those who profit off of hatred, bigotry, and pridefulness. So, um, so thanks for this. I appreciate you and all the great work that you're doing. And if anyone would like to find out more about this original humility flag that was raised by George Washington, or you want to find out more about my book, Pride Comes Before the Fall, Go to bravebooks.com and even consider signing up for the Book of the Month Club. It's awesome because they send a new book every single month to your front door for your kids, grandkids with a pro-God, pro-America value at bravebooks.com. I love it. Kirk Cameron, thank you so much for being here with me today. And thank you all for joining us on the Tudor Dixon Podcast. As always, for this episode and others, you just check out TudorDixonPodcast.com. You can subscribe right there or head over to iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts and make sure you join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday on the Tudor Dixon Podcast. Have an awesome day.